Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you have given us instruction. You have revealed what we need to know regarding the future. And I pray that you would give us understanding of your instruction and of your revelation. And that you would give us the wisdom to trust and obey that we might be prepared and ready for that which lies ahead. And Father, that we would have a ready answer for those who ask us the reason for the hope we have. And that we would be compelled and motivated to uh, share with the world the good news that Jesus Christ has come to save. And Lord, that we would also not hold back the warning that there is a judgment that we all need to be saved from. And so we just commit uh, this time of study to you and ask for your insight and understanding. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Um, some of you who have been gone on vacation, if you remember where we left off in Luke, might think you really missed a lot. Uh, I'm jumping ahead. We left off uh, back in chapter 15, so I'm moving ahead a bit because anyone who is even casually following events taking place in the news these days uh, would notice that there are dramatic changes taking place in our world and a lot of things are changing fast and many of these changes are not for the better and uh, we see a, an increasingly dangerous world unfolding before us and many people are asking questions. Um, many, particularly in the media, are trying to smooth things over. Um, but we as a church need to have some answers. What is happening? What do these things mean? What is the future going to look like? And there is only one place uh, that has the answers to these questions because there is only one being, God, who knows the future. And he has told his children about the future. He has warned us what to expect and how to prepare. And so it is important that we are able to give truthful, wise, biblically informed answers to those all around us who are asking, what is going on in the world today? So looking at Luke chapter 21, and I'm not going to um, exegete each word, each verse. Uh, we're going to give more of a summary of this chapter. And we'll see if we can get through verse 5 to 24 this morning. Uh, that's our goal. Lord willing, we will come close. Uh, then, verse 5, Then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he, that is Jesus, said, These things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now the two temple in Jerusalem had been built back in Zerubbabel's day about 400 years earlier when the Jews had been released from their captivity to the Babylonians and they returned to Israel. Then 46 years before this point in Jesus' life when he is speaking, uh, King Herod the Great had begun a major renovation of the temple compound and he was adding on to it and expanding it incredibly. The renovation was not complete yet at this point in Jesus' life, though it had been going on for 46 years. And it was such a massive project that it would continue for another 30 years after Jesus' statement and not be completed until about A.D. 63. Now, those of you who know the history, A.D. 63 is just seven years before the Romans destroyed it. So this temple that took uh, over 75 years to renovate um, was completed for seven years before de being destroyed. This renovation project was considered one of the great wonders of the Roman Empire. From a distance, it was described by historians as looking like a snow-clad mountain of gold because much of its exterior was uh, plated with gold and what was not overlaid with gold was pure white. And King Herod had been a master builder and his goal 
was to build this temple so well and so strong that it would outlast the Egyptian pyramids. And so he had used massive stones in the construction, and this is part of what was amazing uh, these disciples, and they were commenting on the stones that were being used in this temple. Some of them were almost the size of railroad boxcars, uh, and he didn't want them to move. He wanted this thing permanent. And the entire project, 76 years to complete, lasted for seven years, was destroyed completely by the Romans when Titus conquered Jerusalem to end a Jewish revolt uh, against Romans' rule. There is no man-made security, no man-made stability, no man-made permanence. Um, remember the unsinkable Titanic. Uh, throughout history, man has tried to make that which would endure. And there is nothing of man that will endure. In exact fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy, that not one stone should be left upon another that shall not be thrown down, uh, the Romans had set the temple on fire. And apparently, according to historians, it was not supposed to be burned, but somehow... The command got misunderstood, the temple was burned, and the fire was burnt, was so hot that much of the gold had melted into the cracks and seams between the stones. God was at work in this. In order to plunder all of the gold from the temple, the Roman soldiers were instructed to literally tear apart every stone to get the gold out of the cracks and crevices. And so God made sure that they ripped this entire thing apart, um, smashing and breaking up and tearing out all of those massive rocks. You can be sure it didn't, wasn't accomplished in a day. But in order to plunder the gold, they did this. This was the first of many prophecies which Jesus makes in this chapter 21. Some of them have already come to pass, and others are yet future. Now this is important for us to notice the prophecies of Jesus here that have already come to pass, like this first one, were all fulfilled literally and exactly to the detail. Why is this important to notice that they were fulfilled literally and exactly? Because many of the prophecies of this chapter are still future, and many skeptical people do not believe that they will be fulfilled either literally or exactly, but that they are only symbolic or metaphorical in nature. They are just to communicate a spiritual truth and principle to us. But there is no reason to believe that the yet future prophecies of Christ here will not be fulfilled just as precisely as the already past ones were. Verse 7. So they asked Jesus, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? Now this, this chapter is one of the most difficult chapters in the book of Luke to understand. Uh, however, Matthew and Mark have both recorded this same conversation that was taking place between Jesus and his disciples in their Gospels. And though most of the information in these three accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are um, basically the same information, each one of them shares a little bit more, uh, a little bit of a different perspective, and by putting the three together, you get a more complete picture, and it's helpful. Um, the Bible is always the best commentary on the Bible. If you want to understand, well, what is Luke about? Look at what other parts of the Bible have to say about these subjects, about these topics, and that's your best commentary on it. You cannot find the complete message contained in one place. God has sprinkled his truth throughout the scriptures but his blessing and, and the reward of discovery is for those who will diligently search it out with a heart that is hungry and dependent, that, Lord, show me your truth. And you can't find the complete message in one place. I've often wondered, why isn't the, the gospel all contained in, in one passage, everything that you need to know, but no, in proclaiming the gospel, there's truths scattered throughout the scriptures that that 
are being presented in the gospel message. And this is the way God has put his word together. Two questions are asked by the disciples, and if you look at Matthew's account, you will find in Matthew 24 that there was actually a third question, which only Matthew records, but the answer to it is alluded to in all three Gospels. The three questions, uh, when you put the three Gospels together, are one, when will the temple be destroyed? Two, what sign will there be to indicate that these things are about to take place? And three, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? In Jewish theology of that day, uh, the rabbis, the, the Jewish teachers, taught that there were two ages. And so this is the Jewish thinking, there's two ages. And so what will be the sign of the end of the age? There's two ages. One is the age in which we now live, and the other is the age to come in which Jesus Christ well, in the Jewish mindset, in which the Messiah rules as king on the world. Two ages. One, now up until the coming of Christ, the Messiah, and then that's the end of this age and the beginning of the age of his reign and his rule. So in Scripture, you find these two ages. So when we talk about the end of the age, and some translations use the end of the world, it's not really the end of the world. It's the end of this present age, the coming of Christ, to rule the world for another thousand years. And uh, so the end of the age is that when Christ comes and his kingdom begins. We refer to it, that as the millennial kingdom. Now they believed that this age would end when their Messiah came to earth to judge the nations and to set up his kingdom and to rule the world. And so the signs of the end of this age would be the same signs as the sign of the coming of the Christ, because both would come together. Rather than immediately answering their questions, however, Jesus gave uh, some general characteristics of this present age. And these were signs that all of his followers could expect to see as normal course of living in uh, this time, in this age of history. These are not signs of anything insignificant. For at the end of verse 9, uh, Jesus says, these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. So these are not, verses 8 and 9 are not signs of the end. They're signs of this entire age that we live in, waiting for the end. Verse 8, and Jesus said, take heed that you not be deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, or some translations, rumors of wars, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. First of all, Jesus warned his followers not to be deceived by the many false Christs uh, who would come in his name claiming to be the Messiah, and there have been many of them down through history, but that's not signs of the end. The second general characteristic, he said, would not be signs of the end, would be wars and rumors of wars. Uh, even the many wars and fighting in the, in the Middle East are not in and of themselves signs of the end. Now, there's certain alignments of nations that are signs, but, but the wars taking place wherever they are in the world and rumors of wars, that's just part of history. That's always been, that's always going to be until Christ establishes peace on earth in his kingdom. But then in verses 10 and 11, Jesus does give us prophetic signs of the end. And uh, Luke doesn't specifically tell us that these are signs of the end, but when you compare, looking at Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel, both of them identify these same things that we're going to look at in verse 10 and 11 as the beginnings of sorrows or the beginnings of birth pains. Uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 8, and Matthew 24, verses 7 and 8, um, identify these things as the beginning of birth pains. Birth pains, uh, sorry, verse, verse 10 then, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom 
And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Now, the birth pains that Mark and Matthew describe these signs as refers to the series of painful contractions that a woman experiences in the final hours and minutes of labor before giving birth to a baby. And the beginning of birth pains is that, that first contraction. That, and uh, I've heard that that first contraction isn't as severe as the ones that are coming. And so that's giving us a picture of what's being described here. In Bible prophecy, the world is pictured as going through a series of painful crises and events which will become both increasingly more intense and more frequent, like birth pains, as we draw close to the end of this age and the return of Christ to judge the world and to rule it. So Jesus has said in verse 9, that wars and rumors of wars are not a sign of the end of the age, but we are told that um, what is a sign of the end of the age is a nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. What is described in verse 10 and 11 is the same as the opening of the first six seals that were prophesied by the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 6. So if you read Revelation chapter 6, you will see what Jesus is talking about in Luke 21, verse 10 and 11, expanded in Revelation chapter 6. So they're talking about the same things. In Revelation chapter 6, these are the events that will be common and widespread during the first three and a half years of the tribulation. However, there is a growing evidence that these birth pains described in verses 10 and 11, uh, which will be common characteristic of the first three and a half years of the tribulation, those same things are going to begin before the tribulation. Um, at least there will be some beginning to it. Uh, the explanation, nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom, uh, how is that different from wars and rumors of wars? That is a Jewish idiom. That is a, a saying that was common among the Jewish people um, that is maybe not so common anymore. It was a common saying which meant more than just wars, but it referred to a total widespread conflict. Nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom is a widespread, multi-nation uh, engagement in conflict. Um, the context of the signs being described here seem to be, when you study through Luke chapter 21, not local events that are being described in this chapter so much, but global events. Um, other than the destruction of the, the temple. Therefore, this idiom, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, is believed to describe a global scale conflict or a world war involving many nations, multiplied nations and kingdoms coming together. Now, the first time that such a worldwide conflict of nations and kingdoms occurred was in the years 1914 to 1918 AD with World War I. That was shortly followed by World War II. Both world wars, uh, interestingly, had a tremendous impact on Jewish history and led to the establishment of the State of Israel following World War II in 1948. And the establishing of the state of Israel is in itself the single greatest fulfillment of end time prophecy, uh, though it is not mentioned in chapter 21 here, so we won't spend time on that this morning. But it's believed that these two world wars may very well have been the beginning of what Jesus prophesied as being the beginning of birth pangs and signaling the beginning of the last days uh, leading up to the, the return of Christ. If those two world wars were just the beginning of labor pains, 
it is horrifying to think of what lies ahead for this world as it enters into full-blown labor with increasingly um, stronger birth pangs closer together. Uh, there was more, though, in verse 10 and 11 than a kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation. What about the prophesied great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences and the fearful sights and great signs from heaven. The earthquake factor is interesting. In the first 1900 years since the time of Christ, uh, major earthquakes, though we haven't been able to easily measure or they weren't well documented, it seems that earthquakes were relatively rare uh, in the first 1900 years of, of history. They did happen, but they seem to have greatly increased since uh, the latter years of the 1800s, around 1900. There's been a great increase of major earthquake activity. Between the year 1900 and 2000 AD, there have been 30 major earthquakes which have killed between 10,000 and 200,000 people. So with a minimum death toll of 10,000, uh, the maximum just over 200,000, there's 30 of those earthquakes in that one century. And we are all aware that there are large fault lines running through major population centers all over the world that are in place and ready to bring about widespread destruction if those fault lines are triggered uh, and create earthquake. It's just a matter of timing. The stage is set. Uh, it's ready. Everything is coming into place for the tribulation events to unfold, and all that is needed is for uh, it to be triggered. When we look at some of the worst famines in recorded history, it's interesting to notice that the worst ones took place, uh, many of the worst ones took place within a few years of the two world wars. In fact, from what I could find, most of the worst famines took place clumped around World War I and World War II. In 1920, for example, shortly after World War I, the Great Chinese Famine occurred, killing 43 million people, the worst famine in recorded history, 1920. Shortly before that, the Chinese Famine of 1907 killed 25 million. The Soviet Famine of 1932-33 killed 10 million. The Bengal famine of 1943 killed 7 million. The Great Russian famine, famine in 1921 killed 5 million people. The Vietnamese famine, 1945, killed 2 million people. More recently, the North Korean famine, 1994-98, killed an estimated 3 million. And with current political uh, sanctions increasing today against North Korea in an attempt to halt the development of nuclear weaponry, they could well be facing another famine in the months ahead as that nation is impoverished. Pestilence has not been very common. Uh, that seems to be something that is yet to come. Um, a pestilence is a destructive, infectious, and rapidly spreading disease. During World War I years, however, of 1918 to 1919, a pestilence killed 23 million people. Uh, though the years since have not been characterized by, by pestilence, there is certainly growing concern among the medical uh, field uh, regarding the possibility of widespread pestilence through germ warfare or an outbreak of superbugs at a time when, as we're all aware, antibiotics are rapidly losing their effectiveness. And with so much worldwide travel, as is common today, a pestilence outbreak could easily spread globally and quickly. And again, we see the stage is set Things are in place and ready for the events of the tribulation. Having given a, a brief uh, prophetic description of the, some of the signs that would indicate that the end of the age is drawing near, Jesus now turns back to prophetically describe the immediate future that his disciples would be facing here in this present age which we live. And we'll just read this over uh, verse twenty or verse 12, rather, of Luke 21. 
Notice, but before all these things, before these beginning of birth pains, before these signs of the end of the age, uh, they will lay their hands on you, my disciples, and they will persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers in my name. And all you have to do is read through the book of Acts and read through church history, and that has been the uh, the experience for much of the followers of Christ throughout uh, much of history. These prophecies of Christ, which are already been, have already been fulfilled, have been fulfilled literally, been fulfilled precisely, with accuracy in every detail. Um, pe- believers, followers of Christ, have been arrested. They have been persecuted. They have been delivered up to... Uh, authorities have been delivered to the courts implying that it's going to be illegal and governments are going to judge you for your following Christ and um, so the prophecies that yet remain why wouldn't they be fulfilled as precisely as literally Uh, verse 13 but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. So these things are going to serve the purpose of the gospel. This persecution that you will face will serve for the spread of the gospel. Uh, But don't worry about what you're going to say, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Uh, The Lord promises uh, he will enable you, he will empower you. Verse 16, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. And again, church history is full of exactly this thing happening. Uh, In many countries, if you're part of a Muslim family or a Hindu family or or even a Jewish family, um, historically you... Let it be known that you are a follower of Jesus Christ and your family members will do you in, uh, or in many cases in history have. Verse 18, but not a hair of your head shall be lost by your patience, possess your souls. You say, "Um, wait a minute, you said they will put some of you to death, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. Uh, We won't spend a lot of time on that, but... um, The meaning is similar, I believe, to what Jesus said back in Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, when he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, the symbol of death, daily, and follow me, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. The Bible tells us in Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ, to die is gain. So Jesus Christ is saying here that in losing your life for the sake of the gospel, in family members turning against you for the sake of the gospel, you lose nothing in in light of eternity. It will show that everything that you have sacrificed, everything that you have given up for the sake of the gospel here in this life is preserved for you in heaven and will be restored to you uh, many times over. And um, so going on, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Now Jesus is answering his disciples' question here from verse 7 about when the temple would be destroyed and what would be the sign that it is about to take place. Now this is important for us to watch because this is prophecy that has already been fulfilled and let's see how it was fulfilled and learn how we should shape our attitude towards the prophecies that yet remain for the future. The sign that the temple is about to be destroyed is when the city is surrounded by armies. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by uh, and besieged by armies, that's the sign that the temple is soon going to be destroyed. When that happens, Jesus warns the people are to flee away as fast as possible, stay away from Jerusalem, don't return to the city, For any reason, they were to heed this prophetic warning and take action. Today, we see many prophetic warnings uh, taking place 
that indicate judgment is coming and we too must take action. Let's learn from the history here. Uh, verse 21, Jesus said, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her, in the midst of Jerusalem, depart. So those that are in Judea, the province, leave. Go to the mountains. Uh, if you're in Jerusalem, depart and let not those who are in this country enter her, enter Jerusalem. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Um, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Difficult to flee, difficult circumstances to have uh, a young child or to be pregnant. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations, those who, who don't flee, those who remain there. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now this prophetic warning was taken seriously by the Christian followers of Jesus and has been recorded for us in history. There was a large church in Jerusalem during that, that early history of the church, during that first century of the church, following the resurrection of Christ. We read much about the church in Jerusalem in the book of Acts and the epistles of, of Paul. Uh, collections were made and taken to the church in Jerusalem. It was a persecuted church, but it was a a thriving church, a large church. In the year AD 66, the first Jewish revolt against the Romans broke out, and when the revolt first began, the Roman general in the land, uh, his name was Cestus Gallus, uh, he was stationed in Caesarea Philippi, and he came with his armies from Caesarea and surrounded uh, Jerusalem. The surrounding of the city marked the sign that Jesus had promised. Uh, he surrounded Jerusalem with his armies. Jesus promised, when you see that, get out of the country, get out of the, the city, and don't return. And the Jewish believers knew that Jerusalem was soon going to be destroyed because of Jesus' prophecy. Every Jewish Christian, as they had opportunity, escaped from the city, crossed the Jordan River, and set up a new community of Jewish believers in the town of Pella on the east side of the Jordan. Uh, from what we know, every Jewish Christian got out of the city because of the prophecy of Jesus Christ. Most of the city's population, though, remained. Uh, the Jewish Christians waited on the other side of the Jordan for the prophecy of Jesus to be fulfilled. But Cestus Gallus withdrew his troops from Jerusalem, and it seemed like Jesus' prophecy had been off, been wrong. But part of his warning was that once that sign had come, those who were in the country were not to return and enter the city. So they didn't. And sure enough, without warning, in A.D. 68, a new Roman general by the name of Vespasian and his son Titus again besieged the city, and this time the siege was so tight that no one could escape. The city remained under siege for two years, and most of the population of Jerusalem starved to death before the Romans broke through the walls of the city in A.D. 70, slaughtered most of the population remaining, and uh, took, the, took captive the Jews in the province of Judea. The city and the temple were destroyed, and not one stone was left remaining of the temple structure. Altogether, 1,100,000 Jews uh, were killed in this siege by the Romans, but not one Jewish Christian died because they obeyed the prophetic warnings of Jesus and fled as he had told them to. How seriously should we today take the Lord's prophetic warnings about the days uh, that lie ahead, about the days in which we are living, and when we see uh, warnings of prophecy coming to pass all around us today, how should we be responding? I say it would be wise to trust God's word and obey it, as did the early church in Jerusalem. And though there be delay, though it may seem for a while that, oh, that was just a false warning, uh, we need to trust that God's word is going to come to pass 
uh, just as surely as it did in the past. We need to carefully study the prophetic signs so that we can tell the difference between what the Bible actually teaches and what the false prophets and false teachers are saying. Even in preparing for this study, I found that uh, there was all kinds of nonsense about this chapter on the internet, all kinds of nonsense about this chapter in commentaries uh, and books. You need to check with the scriptures and compare scriptures with scriptures. You need to know what the Bible says, for there's many false teachers, and especially it seems when it comes to prophecy. Always check their message with scripture, is it so? And read it in its context, because false teachers use the Bible, but they twist its meaning and they take it out of context. And so we need to get to know our Bibles. We need to study our Bibles to know what they say. And uh, we need to trust the message that we read in the scriptures. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus and follow him faithfully. That is our greatest security, to follow Christ constantly. He's not going to lead you astray. He will lead you through. Many uh, emergent church leaders, though they, that word isn't used much anymore, but uh, those kind of churches continue, are telling their followers that they don't need the Bible, saying it's too controversial, too many misunderstandings about the Bible, so leave the Bible alone. The Roman Catholic Church at one time said that. You can't understand the Bible, so leave it alone. And they say all you need is to follow Jesus. Well, that is foolish and satanic advice because you can only get to know Jesus through the Scriptures. You can only know what is the way of Jesus through the Scriptures, what he has revealed to himself of himself through the Scriptures. And so... The primary way that Jesus Christ leads us today is through the scriptures. Get to know the Bible. Get to know Jesus through the scriptures. Quickly look back at Jesus' first words in response to his disciples' questions uh, about the signs of the last days. Luke 21, verse 8, Jesus said, Take heed that you not be deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And we don't have time to spend on this, but uh, these many who will come in Jesus' name include invisible demonic beings who will give all kinds of mystical experiences, mystical thoughts and communications to naive followers of emergent church leaders who tell them you don't need the Bible, just follow Jesus, seek Jesus and they are seeking to be guided by a Jesus without the Bible to show them what is the truth about this Jesus. And there are many of these. In these days of so much deception and false teaching, we need to get into this book and learn it like never before. Our lives depend upon it. The lives of your children depend upon it. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, it's absolutely imperative that you put your trust in him to save you from the coming judgment. And so, let us be forewarned. We'll continue this, uh, Lord willing, next week and look at what the rest of this chapter has to say and, and spend a little more on it. But Father, I thank you that you love us and you have sent us out as sheep among wolves, but you told us to... Wait until we be empowered by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, it is your life within us that enables us, though we are sheep among wolves, to be victorious. And we are not to fear. We are not to be afraid. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus and run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Uh, we are not to uh, seek escape but we are to boldly run into the fray carrying the light of the gospel proclaiming the good news of the gospel trusting that our lives are in the hand of Jesus Christ and trusting in you Lord we do not need to fear for even one hair of our head for to live is Christ and to die is gain 
And Lord Jesus, we will rise again triumphant and victorious. And we will live and rule and reign with you here on this earth as your word has promised. And I pray that you would fill our hearts with faith and confidence in that. History has proven that you did come to this earth the first time and you lived as a man, you died in our place and you rose again. And history is going to prove that you will come again and you will rule and reign in this world. You will judge the nations with justice and righteousness. You will make the wrong things right. You will put this world in order and you will cause it to run as you originally created it to and intended it to. And Lord, we look forward to that day. But Lord, the time of your return is not revealed to us. It's in your, time, in your hands. And we pray that we would be found faithful until you return. Not fearful, but Lord, that we would be uh, triumphant, that we would be joyful, that we would be filled with expectation and confidence, that our hope would be in the trustworthy message of the gospel and in the trustworthiness of the one who has proclaimed this, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, almighty creator of heaven and earth. We put our hope and trust in you, God. And thank you that you are going to bring justice to this world. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So let us pray with each other, pray for one another, encourage one another in the Lord, and all the more as you see the day approaching.